everyone, please welcome the director of the whole, Joe Dante, and your moderator for the evening, John Landis. It's a really unknown movie, and this is a very rare screen. 
And I'm told also that this is the only existing DCP of the reading version of the movie. It mm. also almost burned up in the Malibu lab. Mm. So uh, it's sort of like, should we send the movie to the Academy? <laughs> 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 surprised how many movies that happens to. And it's not a unique situation. Mm -hmm. It's kind of shocking, actually. Mm -hmm. And the new one movie is actually more likely to see a lot. This, I fly a lot international, so I'm on the plane for 10 to 14 hours, and uh, I'm always amazed how many movies I find where I go, what the fuck? I mean, with the big <laughs> stars, and sometimes big, but I mean, big names, and you go, I never heard of <laughs> you see it on an airplane, you know, but it's, it's an odd It's a crazy business. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> tell me about shooting, shooting in 3D, why you wanted to shoot in 3D, how you enjoyed the experience, and tell me all about 3D. Well, I, 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 I grew up in the 3D, so I did a lot of 3D movies for a brief period, and I saw a lot. I mean, one of the first movies I ever saw that came out of Jason was in 3D, mm -hmm. and it made a big impression on me. Uh, one of the best. I saw it after the, oh, the wait. Tipping, at the tipping. Hmm. Um, remember the tipping? Yes. Mm -hmm. The world, three, three movies for a dollar. <laughs> um, but uh, it, it, that movie uses 3D in interesting ways because it uses it psychologically and it uses it dramatically. And it's not just throwing things at the camera. It's yeah. I mean, if you use 3D correctly, you can, you can actually add an emotional layer to the picture because it does make you feel like you're in the movie. Tell you 
that my son Max saw Gremlins 2. I brought the laser disc home, and I think he saw it 46,000 times. <laughs> <laughs> and that means I have a lot to answer. <laughs> no, but I'm, I'm just like Gremlins 2. We've burned it. <laughs> 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 have you ever, and also, you know, it was a problem. I know that you always wince or something with explorers. You always had some <laughs> misgiving. I just went to see. But I can't, have you ever seen explorers? <laughs> because you see, once they get on the alien spacecraft, that 15 minutes, how long is it? 20, 20 minutes. minutes. 20 minutes is great! Yeah. Sunk the movie. <laughs> yeah. Did white people didn't like it? I love it. They, 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 were, they were, the rest of the movie looks silvery. And the kids in the movie are like looking for the answer to their, their, their little to the universe. And when they get to the planet and they discover that it's just kids like them, you know, quoting pop culture back to them, which I thought was interesting, uh, the audience was just as disappointed as the kids. <laughs> <laughs> Is that, do you, do you believe that? Oh, it was so brilliant. And Picardo was brilliant. No, he was great. And, every, and one of my favorite shots in it there was another one. But one of the things, there's like Little Richard screaming on the soundtrack and they're dancing and all this stuff's going on, total insanity. <laughs> and you just cut to a wide shot in outer space with the ship and you just hear the music and the quiet from the ship. One of my favorite things. Anyway, um, okay, what else do you want to know? You know, I have to tell you that I was just in New Zealand and Peter Jackson told me that he will never shoot 3D again because, because I just had the experience of turning an old movie and with a conversion, making it 3D. And now that technology is perfect. Mm. And you can actually do better 3D than shooting it 3D. Mm -hmm. Although the problem was, you know, if I had known that, you would have composed that for 3D, which I didn't do. But still, it's, it's an amazing process, yes. No questions, but two movies in particular, um, and now my kids have discovered. The Longest Day in Ben Hur. Yes. No, they fell in love with explorers, and I, I don't know why. I mean, kids I don't know, do. it, it's a, I don't know why it went, but. Um, no, I went because, because the picture was really not finished, and I, I did a rough cut, and then uh, I wanted to finish the movie. So okay. I, for me, it's a little, there's a source on it, there's not even finished. They, would, they, they really fell, they fell in love with it. Yeah. Why? 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 Well, because they changed administrations. The, 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 uh, the administration of Paramount left and went to Disney and left me with mm -hmm. Mark Mahito, uh, who was the marketing guy, and he just took the set, took the entire slate of pictures that these guys had in production, and they said, "Don't dump these. Just stop right now. Don't work. Don't spend any more money. Finish them and put them out." And then they proceeded to, you know, quite, you know make sure that they didn't make any money, so nobody. I mean, the, all those pictures just were, they just turned into, you took, for a whole year, 1985, you know, pictures that Paramount gave up on. And you did, so you weren't even allowed to, what, what did you have left to do? You shot it? I, I was, I was, I, I had a preview of my rock cut. But the, but, and then they, they just said, finish it. And, said, but, but, and, and it was two months before the scheduled, my scheduling date. And, and, I, and at the time, Peter Bogdanovich was, was being sued by uh, Universal for mass. <laughs> I don't think that took my because I was part of that, that they didn't take it away from him. He wanted a piece of music. He sued him anyway. Because he wanted to be, Peter wanted a piece, he wanted a couple of needle drop songs. By the way, Mask is a really good movie. Yeah. And they they said, well no, the songs were like a million dollars a piece. And they said, no, replace them. And he refused. And was supposed to scream at Canaan, and Peter refused to compromise. And they said, "Well, sorry, he, they didn't cut it, they didn't take it away. They said, 
replace those two pieces of music, and he refused. He also, I was in London at the time, published a full page ad for Variety <laughs> saying, Universal's fucking with you, yeah, 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 and here people support me. And he put my, my name on it, <laughs> and all kinds of people on it, and most of whom he didn't ask. We were supporting him. But what was interesting about it was the studio said, fuck you, we're showing it again, because Cher said she'd show up. And they replaced, I don't know who did it, but someone chose music, they showed it again, Gigantic hit, shared his best actors in the end. The movie's really good movie was a hit, and to this day, Peter talks about, I fucked me, you know? They didn't recut it, it's his movie. I don't, you know, I don't understand. The other non my daughter's brother. The reason they sued him was to show it at the end, and they won. Chris Columbus has been developing Gremlins 3 for longer than, than your, your Aunt Minnie has been able to hide. <laughs> I, whether anything will ever come of it, I have no idea. I have no idea of what techniques they're going to use or what they're going to do. It's, just, it's at the complete out of my hands. Yeah, when you hear stuff like that, like so many people have said to me, hey, that's so great, you're making a sequel and coming to America. No, I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> Paramount has announced it. I know nothing about it. <laughs> they, they, these people don't have to go back to you, you know. They, 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 yeah, they, if you're the director, then no. You have to be the producer, though. Or the writer. Or the writer. Because yeah. you have the underlying writer. Yeah. Yes. Well, my thing with Lowell, um, it was really fascinating the way the film reflects a lot of films from the past, like Dr. Caligari. He reminded me of, like, Orson Welles' The Trial. How much does your love for film history influence your work? Like you are like glove factory. Well, that's just that's just purely preference, but uh, it's not conscious. It's just my my. I've seen a lot of movies. They're all up in my head. Uh, they come out inappropriate and sometimes they're inappropriate. Uh, and um, that's why you see echoes of other people's stuff in my in my movies. It's just because I that's part of my background. That's not entirely true. Some of it's subconscious, but a lot of it is Joe doing. Subconscious or unconscious. Or unconscious, that's true. <laughs> yes. Yeah, um, I just wanted you to know, because you know, talk about the movie, this is the third and two thirds times that I've seen this in the theater. <laughs> 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 so, yeah. see the two thirds because of the Ryerson and the uh, fire alarm in Toronto. Oh, you were there? I was there. I saw that was the best thing. At what point did the fire alarm go? Uh, right before the third act. <laughs> oh. on our theme of uh, Untold Horror, and you guys touched a little bit about projects that you're not involved with and some of the frustrations. Um, you guys have worked together and been friends for a long time, and I would love to hear you guys talk about the whole Creature from the Black Lagoon Jaws 3 <coughs> thing that went down, <laughs> because it's a fantastic story. Could you tell us a little bit about... Well, well Jaws 3 and Creature from the Black Lagoon are separate stories. 
Well, well they intersect. Actually, we were both screwed by the same thing. <laughs> which is <laughs> universal. <laughs> Sid Scheinberg, actually. Yeah. Joe was developing Jaws 3 People Zero <laughs> for <laughs> National Lampoon <laughs> and Universal. <laughs> and that was, and tell them who you cast before 10. Oh, it was Bo Derrick. Yeah, Bo Derrick in it before people knew who she was. <laughs> but the problem was that, um, uh, and John Hughes actually. Sir. 
learn something that enhances the movie. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. you guys are two very accomplished directors, and I think you still have pull enough to make 3D movies. And help That's because you're naive. <laughs> 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 I'm reverent. <laughs> I'm reverent. <laughs> you're not reverent. You're naive. <laughs> you know, we're always thinking, I'll give it to John Landis. He'll get it. He can get it made. <laughs> no, we're not. That's not that. the case. That's not the case. No. I wish. Well, what do you think is going to happen with 3D? With uh, is James Cameron going to once again come out with his Avatar to oh, make yeah. it big again, oh, and everyone's yeah. going to jump on the bandwagon? No, I know. it's going to come out and it's going to be big, but I don't think everybody's going to jump back on the bandwagon. I mean, it, look, every every cartoon, every every uh, animated uh, you know, CGI uh, picture is is in 3D because it's very simple. Uh, and so that's a, that's, that's a given that you just do that because you can. And, uh, and, and I think probably even now that, uh, as John says, the, the technology has gotten so much better to, to post. The last three Marvel movies, you know how they always release it 3D and then they release it flat? And it, it, they would be in some, you would see it 3D or flat. The last three Marvel movies, the flat versions, triple the income of the 3D version. Mm -hmm. So it's just. Well, it's just, it's, it's actually getting simpler and simpler. And as I said, conversion now is amazing what you can do sitting, you know, and, and Peter's right, Peter Jackson's right. There's no reason to actually go through what Joe went through and what all those so My favorite thing is the most successful 3D movie in the first 3D craze in the 50s, which was House of Wax, directed by the one-eyed man. <laughs>
It's gorgeously photographed by Robert Pink. So I was anxious to get to the negative and show, because I did like two 35 millimeter prints, they're gorgeous, but by making it 3D, I could, I could you know, make it perfect. And boy, it's gorgeous. And interestingly enough, it's cool in 3D. A couple of the monster mm -hmm. stuff, you know, like when he grows on the ground, he goes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's pretty cool in 3D. That's also why I made that hands go into the theater, you know. But the most impressive thing is the dance number is 70% better in 3D, even though I didn't, like, when I did it, I didn't think 3D. <laughs> it's just the way they're arranged, it's perfect for 3D, and it makes it so much, it's incredible, it really makes it much better. But I agree with Joe. No, unless you're going to plan it, there's no reason to do it. So did the 3D kill the creature ultimately? How? Oh, so I didn't finish the story. So, <laughs> so Ned goes, okay, let's sew it. So here's Lou and Sid. We show them the test, which is a minute and a half. Sid so says, show me that again. They show it to him again. And he goes, this is fantastic. This is amazing. You know, fuck the creature from the Black Lagoon. And fuck. Jaws 3 people zero, it's Jaws 3D. <laughs> and then they actually made Jaws 3D yeah. and they used a cheaper system. They didn't even use the good frame. Right. It's the over under and Brown and Zanuck had nothing to do with that. Uh, really. <laughs> so, yes. My favorite horror movies are werewolf movies. Huh. Now, both of your films were released in 1981. Were you guys friends then? And did you know that you were each doing The Howling and American Werewolf? Well, we were friends until we found out we were making it. <laughs> <laughs> I actually found out only because um, I had been trying to make an American Werewolf London since 1969. And I only found, when I finally, after years and years in 1981, made a deal on Werewolf, I immediately called Rick Baker, who I'd given the script in 
work for us. So they said, well, that, this is still works fine. We can let you do this, and you know, it'll, it'll come and go and be fine, and then he'll make big money pictures for us and everything. And then, luckily, because they weren't paying attention, it turned out to be good. <laughs> <laughs> but I think they were genuinely surprised. They were, they were shocked. That's a huge success in that movie. <laughs> you know, they were all going, that's what we meant, Joe. <laughs> when we were giving you shit, that's really what we meant. <laughs> Joe, when they were marketing that movie, it was presented as Steven Spielberg Presents, and it didn't mention your name at all. Did you feel bad? Were you like, hey, I put up my heart and everything into this movie? No, nobody's going to come to the movie because Joe Dante presented. <laughs> <laughs> Not then. Or I don't even like a couple of pictures. And, uh, you know, it was, it was the Spielberg uh, name that, that got it attention. I mean, I don't, I don't think it was... A lot of people who went to see it, I think it was Spielberg, were, were, were annoyed that it was just, <laughs> just different than what they expected. But then there were other people Despite the fact that it was a Spielberg movie, I liked it. And, uh, who can explain it? The same movie could have come out six months earlier, six months later, and, and done nothing. I mean, it was the right movie at the right time, and we were all watching the movie at one of those. Well, that's true. The zeitgeist has everything to do with the success of a movie. Really bad movies are big hits all the time. <laughs> and really good movies fail all the time. And, and what I've had in my career, in fact, Joe has too. Joe actually has got better reviews than me usually. <laughs> but we both are old enough now. I have, I've made a lot of movies that were shit on by the critics <laughs> that are now referred to as classic films <laughs> and held up as role models. Yep. And they're the same movies that they, they hated. But that's also because the people who hated them were older. And a lot of the same people. And, yeah. and, 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 and the younger people saw them.
truly great. And when I saw it with my wife the other day, big, um, I thought, what a crime that this will be seen on Netflix who pay for it. So. Yeah. But they're only putting it in the theater to qualify for an Oscar. Yeah. It's huge, Cinemascope, mm -hmm. gorgeous black and white photography. Yeah. Yeah. And when it was over, I turned to Deborah and I had this epiphany, which is, I was born in 1950. So, like Joe, we're children of the 50s and 60s, which means I used to go to the movies and people like Hitchcock, Truffaut, Godard, Fellini, Bergman, David Lean, you know, I mean, Sidney Lovett, I mean, so many great filmmakers and so many great films came out, you know, from De Sica, from Weber and Weiss, I mean, from all over the world. You had Kurosawa always making pictures. I mean, you'd go to the movies and you'd often see a movie by David Lean. When I saw Romo, when it was finished, I turned to Deb and I said, you know, I can't remember the last time I saw a truly great film like this. I've seen lots of movies I liked and lots of good movies, but this is one for the ages. You, know, you heard it here. <laughs> and not, um, but anyway, anything else for Joe about his entire career? Uh, um, Uh, I mean, it was, look, I have to replace Gary Goldsmith with somebody, and uh, I just seem to have uh, breath and love the music, and I uh, and talk to Guillermo about it, and uh, Javier was available, and uh, I think we found him uh, a wonderful guy. Unfortunately, he had to record the music in Slovak or Slovenia or something. And we had to do it, and because of that, we had to do it in the middle of the night when it was daytime over there, so all the music, and we, we didn't, we couldn't afford to go. Yes! <laughs> 